Uh, okay, so let's deal with the arguments. Um, the first thing I want to point out is that it doesn't necessarily incumbent upon me to provide evidence for atheism. I mean, if we say that aliens don't exist, I don't have to prove to you that they don't exist. You need to prove to me that they do. Or if there's fairies in the woods or demons and so forth. The, cl the claimant has to actually establish the fact. We, we don't necessarily have to have evidence against the proposition. Nevertheless, we do have evidence against the proposition, as I'll get to. His first argument uh, is that the creation of the universe. He starts with the space-time had a beginning argument. This has actually been rejected by scientists. This is old news. Uh, the, the Hawking Penrose theorem was the theorem originally that argued that the universe must have begun at a singularity, but both Hawking and Penrose have both agreed that that theorem is false because quantum mechanics makes it impossible. So we don't actually know that space-time itself began with the Big Bang. We just know that the observable universe that we're in began at the Big Bang. We don't know what occurred before it. So we can't actually establish that the universe had a beginning. And also mathematicians will tell you, any, any PhD in mathematics will tell you that an actual infinite is possible. There's nothing that actually makes that impossible. It could be extended infinite time into the past. If I hold up my finger here and show it to you, geometrically there's an infinite number, an actual infinite number of points on my fingernail. So you're looking at an actual infinity right now. So you can't really say that it is impossible. And the same with the series, infinite series of the past. You don't have to start at the beginning and leap to any point in the middle. If you have an infinite string of pearls, you can't say that, that none of the pearls on that string exist. Obviously, they all exist. If each pearl is a universe with a Big Bang at the beginning of it, then obviously we could exist in an infinite string of Big Bang uh, universes. So there's nothing impossible about that. It's not illogical. With regard to uh, the nature of the universe, it's supposed to be finely tuned uh, for life. It really isn't. Uh, I want you to think about the cosmology and astrophysics here for a moment. 99.9999%. That's a large percentage. That percentage of the universe is filled with a lethal radiation-filled vacuum. Life can't exist in it. So that means the vast quantity of the universe is inhospitable life, lethal life. If you take, take that aside and just look at the other material that's in the universe, 99.9999% of that is, consists of stars and black holes in which life cannot live. So the vast amount of the material in the universe is inhospitable to life. And even if you look at the remaining stuff, most of that is also inhospitable to life. In fact, if you do the math, if you put the entire universe, the observable universe, into a house, the amount of volume in that house that would be hospitable to life would be smaller than a proton. Now, if you walked into a house and there was only one proton in there that was hospitable to life, you would not conclude that that, uni that house was designed for life. The universe is clearly not designed for life. And an important point of this is that Let's flip this around. Let's look at how it would actually be. Now, if there is no God that designed the universe that designed life, what is the only universe that we could see? Now, first of all, it would mean that life is a chemical accident. He talked about that at the beginning of life. Life is a chemical accident. It's a very improbable accident. That's true. Uh, that means for something like that to happen, the universe has to be really old and really big. So there's lots of chemistry sets practicing and experimenting with creating molecules before one of them will come up. It's like a lottery. The odds of winning a lottery are low, but if you have a million people playing the lottery, one of them is going to win. So if you see a lottery win, you should expect that there's going to be millions of players. And that's the case here. The only universe that we could see ourselves in is a universe that's vastly old and vastly huge and has vast amounts of material in it and has lots of chemistry sets experimenting. And yet, look, that's the universe we see. So in fact, the godless hypothesis actually predicts observations about the universe that are confirmed. And those are observations that we couldn't predict from the god hypothesis. I mean, why would God need a universe that's 99.99999% inhospitable to life? Why would he make a house that's completely lethal to life except for one little proton in it. Uh, the godless hypothesis predicts this, the uh, god hypothesis does not. Now with regard to uh, life itself, you know, evolution, you can go look this up, Google it. Uh, I, don't, I don't really need to defend it. The science is really well established. We can explain all the life on Earth by appeal to evolution by natural selection. The, the only thing that you might look at is, well, then how did it all begin? It had to begin with that random molecular accident. And that's probably what it was. It was probably a very simple uh, organism. He talked about like these really complex uh, pieces in cells, but those are highly evolved. And I want you to think about this for a moment. Single-celled organisms have been on this planet evolving six times longer than multi-celled organisms. That means a bacteria is six times more evolved than you are. So I want you to think about that. And it was it evolved all through that time before it even got around to having the machinery capable of making multi-celled life. So that's a really, really long time of evolution. So, and all of that machinery evolved slowly over that time. The first life was a much simpler, much simpler molecule. So we don't really have a problem explaining that. And in fact, that's exactly what we should expect to see. If there is no God who designed life, who just, you know, you could talk about the Adam and Eve story if you want or whatever. If God designed life, he wouldn't sit around twiddling his thumbs waiting for single-celled organisms to evolve six times longer for three billion years, by the way. Three billion years, and then suddenly, oh, okay, you know what? We need multi-celled life. Uh, I don't know why I didn't think of that before. 
Uh, but if there is no God, that's exactly what we have to see. You have to see a huge amount of evolution of single-celled organisms before they become complex enough to perform multi-celled life. Uh, and then, of course, multi-celled life evolved for 500, billion year, or 500 million years before it got to evolve us. So this kind of huge scale of time, of slow evolution over time, is exactly what atheism predicts, but it's not what the God hypothesis predicts. So let's get to consciousness. Um, he says consciousness only comes from consciousness. I'm not aware of that being the case. Uh, sperm is not conscious, so uh, neither is the egg. So consciousness comes from the formation of a brain in a womb. It takes a while to build one. Um, and we have evidence, in fact, that it is, does come from the brain, that we need a brain to do it. Uh, not, not only do we have uh, lots of evidence from the fact that you know, when people die, there's no consciousness around, but we can also break it. We can break your consciousness. We can go into your brain, if a bullet can go through your brain, or a doctor or a surgeon can go into your brain and cut out a piece of it, and you'll lose that function. For example, there's a part of your brain that recognizes faces. We can cut that out, and then you can't recognize faces anymore. You've lost a part of your consciousness. So, uh, and you can take, there's every single thing that we do, every single, single thing, the, the, the vision, the seeing of color, the seeing of red, there's a location in the brain where that is. We can cut it out and then you won't have it anymore. So we know there's actual machinery that's actually generating this stuff. Now we don't know, we don't have a full theory yet exactly how it does that, but we know a lot of evidence that points to the fact that it is something going on inside the brain mechanically, chemically, that's producing consciousness. There's a lot of science to back that up. And once again, this actually argues for atheism because a God wouldn't need, you to, wouldn't need to give you a very fragile, large, energy-consuming brain to have consciousness. He could just give you a soul. You know, your brain consumes 20% of the energy uh, that you eat. So you have to eat more. You have to waste a lot of energy. You have to breathe more in order to keep that brain working and generating consciousness. But if you had a soul, you wouldn't need that brain. Likewise, think how fragile the brain is, brain damage, how easily it is to, to destroy or uh, disrupt someone's reasoning with chemicals or with injuries. But if you had a soul, you couldn't be injured. You'd have a, a well-functioning brain or well-functioning mind all the time. But on atheism, the only way you could have consciousness is from an extremely complex machine like the brain. And the brain is extremely complex. Uh, it has a specified complexity that's greater than 10 to the power of 5 million. If you know anything about math, you realize that's an extremely complex organ. And why do we need this extra, extremely large, complex organ, this energy hog? Well, it's because on atheism, that only that kind of thing could produce something as complex as consciousness. So atheism actually predicts that you would have a huge, complex brain if you're conscious, because that's the only way you could be. But if God exists, that wouldn't be necessary. Uh, then we get to moral values. Um, he talks about the, going on the wrong side of the road as a social construct, whether it's left or right. Uh, in England, it's one, and here it's the other. But notice you have to pick a side. You can't have people willy-nilly going on one side or the other. That's the traffic system wouldn't work. And that's an objective fact about traffic systems. You have to have sightedness. You have to pick left or right as the standard side to drive on. And that evolves, or that emerges from the natural facts, the physical facts. And morality is just like this. He says it's not, but no, it is, in fact, like that. Morality is no different. Morality derives from what we have to do to have a functional and desirable society, a society we want to live in. Do you want to live in the murder capital of the world, Juarez, Mexico, or do you want to live here, which is a substantially better place to live? And if you look at place to place to place, what is a better place, a worse place, it is a direct function of the moral behavior of the people in it. And that's what you have to do. It's just like littering. I can't expect to live in a clean environment, in a clean city, if I'm, the one, if I'm also littering. Now, of course, that means everybody has to refrain from littering to keep litter off of the streets. But everyone includes me, so I have to actually participate in that. So if I want a clean society, I have to participate in that. And that's the same with morality. If I want a, a society I want to live in, I have to participate in creating that society. There isn't any other way to do it. And there are other reasons I talk about in Sense and Goodness Without God as to why we should be moral and what motivates us to be moral. As social animals that we've evolved to be, we actually are happier as moral animals internally. Uh, as com the compassion itself is actually a source of pleasure and can actually make our lives better and more fulfilling if we live by that way rather than living an empty life. And this is the nature of social animals all throughout the animal kingdom. And then he talks about resurrection. Uh, he mentions three facts uh, that Jesus died. That's fine. And that could have happened. I don't, uh, I don't actually uh, insist that it's certain that Jesus didn't exist. He may have done. Uh, I think the evidence tends the other way, but it's, uh, the evidence is very uncertain. So it's quite possible that there was a Jesus who died. That, but then he says that uh, his disciples had experiences. And he says there's near unanimous agreement by scholars. Well, yeah, that's because most of those scholars concur that these were visions and hallucinations, that they were resurrection revelations. And Paul himself is our only eyewitness source who actually says and describes anything to do with what the, these experiences were like. And he says it was a revelation of Jesus Christ. He says it was a vision. And in the book of Acts, it actually says that it was just a, a light in the sky, that he actually saw a vision of a bright light uh, and a voice talking to him. 
So, uh, and we have lots of pagans in this period, even eyewitness uh, accounts by pagans in this period, who also saw their gods, uh, had visions of them, and so on. Uh, this is actually a common religious phenomenon. It has psychological explanations. The fact that everybody's seeing different gods is kind of pretty conclusive evidence that they're not seeing the god. They're seeing something else that their mind is generating. And the, what they see is always culturally predetermined. So you can look for what the Chinese people are hallucinating. They're hallucinating Chinese gods, and, and Greeks are hallucinating Greek gods, and the Jews are hallucinating Jewish gods, or Jewish angels, as the case may be. Uh, that kind of pretty much tells you that the source there is cultural, not uh, supernatural. And then he mentions that Paul dramatically converted. Um, actually, this is kind of evidence against uh, the validity of the resurrection theory. Out of the hundreds, if not thousands, of opponents of the church, only one guy changed his mind. Now, I want you to think about that. Uh, the probability that there would be one person that might, real, might feel guilt at what he was doing to the Christians or might realize that the Christians had a really good idea for reforming society or whatever the case may be and may have had one of these religious experiences. Maybe he fasted and got himself into an altered state of consciousness and his guilt overwhelmed him and he actually had an experience, a subconscious experience, of God telling him, you know, you're wrong, you should really get with these Christians. And he converted. Now, you'd think that would be unlikely. Well, yeah, unlikely means infrequent, which means there's only going to be a few of them. Well, there was only one. That's few. Uh, so, in fact, on the atheist hypothesis, we, the prediction is fulfilled. We actually we should expect to see few people like Paul. Paul is alone, so we see few people like Paul. Now, if Jesus was God and actually wanted to appear to people and actually wanted to convert persecutors of Christianity, he could have appeared to all of them. Why didn't he? Uh, a God can do that. But natural hallucinations are only going to appear, only going to occur to certain few people, and that's exactly what we observe to be the case. 